we are 43rd in the world in healthcare. We spend two and a half times more than any other country. And our, the health of our nation is absolutely deplorable. I mean, we can't look the other way. Enemas, liver flushes, cell phones and cancer, electromagnetic fields, and so much more is covered in today's episode. I have on the show Dr. Keneally. She treats the patient with the disease and not the disease of the patient while determining the origin of the illness and is a prominent leader in the field of integrative medicine. She utilizes the best of all sciences, including conventional homeopathic, Eastern medicine, and modern medicine. She is also the medical director of Cancer Center for Healing and Center for New Medicine and author of the book, The Cancer Evolution. And she is here today to share her knowledge and wake us up when it comes to food and the cancer connection. Welcome back to the Digest This podcast. I'm your host, Bethany Cameron. But before we get into the episode, shout out to podcast listener J underscore Fahe. They wrote, I have been following Bethany for quite a while now and have switched to a lot of the products and routines she suggests because I am a scientist who listens and researches just as she does. It is refreshing to have someone sharing research and truly beneficial advice and products I can trust. Thank you so much for that wonderful podcast review. And as always, I love hearing your thoughts and reading your reviews. So if you haven't done so, please do. It does help support the show. And of course, I just love knowing what you enjoy about the show. And if you have any tips, advice, feel free to put them in the comment section as well. It's getting into summer, which means more traveling, but with traveling comes the headache of opting for toxic products small enough to be TSA passed, such as mainstream mini toothpaste tubes. But surprisingly, in my latest regular shipment of my bite toothpaste bits, I noticed on the package it says TSA approved even their mouthwash, because their, quote, mouthwash isn't actually a liquid. Just like their toothpaste bits, Bites mouthwash are tablets you can take anywhere and even stash in your purse anytime you need to rinse your mouth and freshen up. Just bite down on a tablet and chew, then take a sip of water and swish it around in your mouth as you would mouthwash. Just spit it out and then you're good to go. I absolutely love Bite and their non-toxic oral care. Everything from their toothpaste bits to their mouthwash and even their teeth whitening kits. And they now have a charcoal version. And I know charcoal on your teeth sounds like they would actually make your teeth more dirty, but it's quite the opposite. Activated charcoal naturally helps whiten your teeth. So you get a two for one deal with toothpaste and gentle whitening all in a non-toxic tablet that comes in glass jars. So if you've been looking for a natural toothpaste without the paste, try Bite Toothpaste Tablets and experience what I, my husband, and so many others are obsessed with. Bite is offering my listeners 20% off your first order. Go to trybite.com slash digest or use code digest at checkout to claim this deal. I hope you guys love it. If you're not subscribed to my newsletters, they come out every Friday and they're called Friday Finds. This is information that only my subscribers get in their inbox. I share stuff like non-toxic air fryers and kitchen appliances, new food finds, product recalls, food news, and food products that aren't even on the market yet, but 
I've got the scoop. This is not published anywhere else and cannot be found on my blog. So be sure you're in the know and subscribe to my weekly newsletters by going to littlesipper.com slash subscribe and enter your email. That's all you have to do. So go to L-I-L-S-I-P-P-E-R.com forward slash subscribe to get exclusive information on everything food. Thank you so much, Dr. Keneally, for joining the show today. Great to be here. Well, before we get into all the nitty gritty questions, why don't you introduce yourself and tell my listeners who you are and what you do? All right, I'm Dr. Lee Erin Keneally, and I'm the medical director at Center for New Medicine and Cancer Center for Healing. So there are two clinics that are joined together. One is for human optimization and chronic disease like diabetes, autoimmune, et cetera. And then the Cancer Center for Healing is patients who've been diagnosed with cancer and who are possibly going to be staying with us for a longer period of time. And so I started you know, practicing about 37 years ago, and I, I was actually in Los Angeles and I started out actually with a dietitian doing functional medicine a long, long time ago. And so uh, I kind of focused on weight loss then. Um, and then it just, you know, when you do weight loss, you have to treat diabetes, you've got to treat hormone problems, you've got to do everything. But, you know, doctors don't focus on patients' you know, way of life every day. And so you've got to make sure that their way of life is good so that the other things are good. And so, um, so you know, a lot of people don't know and understand functional integrative medicine. So it's combining the best of conventional Western medicine, meaning laboratory tests and maybe scanning and, you know, maybe some, you know, DNA testing, maybe, you know, all, all kinds of things, but it's combining it with you know, the treatment could be anything from energy work to lymphatic drainage to specialty IVs to, um, uh, you know, hyperbaric to pulsed electromagnetic fields to red light to laser to everything. So most of our patients really don't want to take medications. So we try to not treat our patients. We try to fix our patients so that they are, you know, independent and have mastered self-care so they can take care of themselves. Yeah. And that's what I love about your practice is that you do approach it in an alternative way and alternative medicine, because there are so many people that don't want to go through all the medications and all the different treatments and injections or what have you. And so because you do work with a variety of patients, uh, cancer, including what kind of treatment do you do for cancer patients? Okay. So for cancer patients, first of all, The most important thing is to do a really, really good history and physical. And in conventional medicine today, you have maybe five, 10, 15 minutes to get the landscape of a patient. But I always tell patients, no disease just appears in your system, okay? You don't get cancer just one day. You don't get diabetes one day. You don't get autoimmune. All these diseases are in like this perfect storm and and, um, the storm goes on and on and on. And then you get into a crisis where you have to emergently go to the doctor or an ER. And so, um, so it's very important to understand someone's entire life journey. And so, because that's going to help you how you're going to treat, okay? Because every single thing, there's a great book called Your Body Keeps Score. Your body knows everything. And so we, we as physicians need to know your life journey so we can put together and synthesize the best treatment plan. And then I like to know how everyone lives every day. Like how much sleep do you get? How much water do you drink purified water? What is your eating protocol you know, what is your activity level? What has been your stress for the last 10 years, especially? And so, because cancer starts 
about 10 years prior to a conventional diagnosis. Most people don't have symptoms for 10 years. And then all of a sudden they have a stomach pain, they have a cough, they find a lump in their breast or something really crises happens. And then they immediately get worked up and get, you know, scanning and a little bit of blood work, not that much blood work. And then, okay, then they get on the conveyor belt of surgery, chemo and radiation. And surgery may be necessary for a patient uh, and those may be part of their treatment protocol. Obviously every individual is an original, but I do very, very comprehensive blood work. When you see an oncologist, the oncologist typically just does a chemistry panel looking at your electrolytes, kidney and liver, and a CBC to look at your white count and your hemoglobin and your blood indices. And with me though, I do everything. I check your hemoglobin A1C, which is a reflection of your sugar. So like if you're pre-diabetic or diabetic, your cells aren't gonna work that well for you. If you have inflammation through CRP, that tells me, okay, I gotta get inflammation down. And what's causing the inflammation? What's your vitamin D level? What are all your hormones? Because your hormones are the natural drugs to your body. For example, thyroid function is, is dictating the energy voltage of every single one of your cells. So if your thyroid's not right, that's not going to be good. And then I want to know, is your body have proper oxygenation? So I do a fasting blood test called PHI, which is phosphohexoisomerase which is an indication of anaerobic metabolism. Anaerobic means without oxygen. And so if you have anaerobic, that means you have an environment for cancer. So if we don't, we can do all the treatments, but if we don't treat the actual soil, terrain, environment, whatever word you want to use, you're, you know, the situation is not going to go away. It's going to come back. You might get rid of it for a month or two or a year, but you've still got to change the environment. Then we do nagalase, which is an enzyme that prevents the macrophages from attacking the cancer. I always do immune, um, an immune panel, okay, looking at your natural killer cells. And so, um, so our, and I always do a very comprehensive nutrient testing, all right? And then, I, of course, I may order imaging because imaging is, is important to understand the landscape of the illness. Is it just in the breast or is it somewhere else? Okay. So sometimes we have to do imaging. So typical imaging is a, 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 either a PET CT or a CT called chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And so um, a lot of my patients really don't like the radiation. So I'll order a whole body MRI without uh, gadolinium, which is the normal um, dye that they use for MRIs. Um, so that technology is getting better and better every day because everything you do, you've got to counterbalance. So if you do a PET scan, you have to give the patient the necessary counterbalancing pr procedures and or supplements so they're not damaged by all the radiation. And yeah. so... So, you know, so anyway, so I do a lot of, I, I'm always want to know everything about the patient, all right, because that's how I'm going to best treat you because most patients have had extreme stress. So that means I've got to give them, you know, proper meditation advice, proper healing informations. We do emotional work on every single person because you've got to rewire their recordings that are happening in their brain every single day. Just getting diagnosed with cancer is so traumatic and so fearful, and it's just so overwhelming. And so you've got to get the patient like, let's think, let's look at the good of what's going on here, you know? That's something that's I feel like completely different with your practice is that obviously you want to treat the cancer that is present, but you also want to treat what perhaps caused the cancer, which I feel like no one does because so many times you hear about my cancer came back, my cancer came back. And th because no one addressed why it appeared in the first place. And so what you're doing is just phenomenal. And I also want to uh, talk about too, because is it true that cancer is coming up more and more in younger people, even kids today? Right. Well, that's what the unfortunate thing. And and I did a I we every two weeks we do something called cancer conversation. And so we talked about that because in the last 18 months, 
I have seen an incredible surge of young people around 30, 25, 30, 35 year olds with cancer. And you're like, what is going on? This is just absolutely crazy. And then you mentioned children. Cancer used to be number two after accidents. Now cancer is number one in young, very young children. And we all should be read, you know, we should all be saying this is a 911, okay? And we should all be having Oh, you know, very open, candid conversation about the crises we're facing in health. I always tell people we are 43rd in the world in healthcare. We spend two and a half times more than any other country. And our the state of our the health of our nation is absolutely deplorable. Autism is now one in 36. I didn't even learn hardly anything in autism when I went to medical school. And we are seeing the trends every year worse and worse. But why are we saying, how do we prevent this? How, what do we do with the mother who wants to have a child? Why don't we tell her to learn how to steward her body so she doesn't, you know, download so many toxins to the baby, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, our young people, elementary kids, 60% have one or more chronic illness, diabetes, ADD. I mean, it goes on and on. And then our teenagers have the highest anxiety, depression, violence, and suicide ever. Like, like we should all be together collaborating cooperatively. Look, we've got to change what's going on. And then you see all these young people with cancer. I mean, we can't look the other way. We've got to take a stand right now. And I know podcasts are doing it like we're doing this right now, trying to create awareness. I know there's some health, amazing health warriors, and it just needs to create this, you know, worldwide contagion because it's not just in the U.S. I mean, cancer is bad in all the other countries also. So it's one in two people today. So we're not talking about prevention and early detection. It's like, okay, it's just like, okay, wait till the train wreck appears in your office or in the emergency room. We can't do that anymore. We can't be reactive. It's We have all these people that are unable to live their life. And eventually the community just is, is, is absolutely, you know, devastated. And so we need the community to help each other be the best version of ourselves. Yeah, I love that. And the current health status of our country. So, I mean, I know you touched on a few things that cancer is just on the rise like crazy, especially in young people. And I mean, what is the difference between today and just 50 years ago, you know, uh, do you think it's technology? Do you think it's the, what the food that we eat? Do you think it's a combination? Like what do you feel is the biggest factor attributing to cancer today? Right. Well, I reflect on this uh, a long time because I have young adult children and I have grandchildren. So it's something like, okay, you know, what, what is it that we need to do? But I think, uh, cause I, and I say, okay, you know, thank you, God, for giving me this phenomenal information so I can guide people the best way. And I always tell people, no disease is just one thing, right? So, but if you look what's happened in the last 30 years, okay, so the pollution is at an all-time high. I tell people we're living in the great poisoning, okay? The air pollution, the water pollution, the food pollution. So, you know, the amount of toxins that are going into our system is abominable. Then number two, I think technology, you know, electromagnetic fields came into existence, uh, you know, probably around 30. And I would say in the last 10 years, it's, you know, exploded, you know, phones and iPads and computers and cell towers and satellites. And I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And so, and I've been studying, you know, electromagnetic fields for probably 15 years. And so, and I've had a meter for a long time. I take a lot of proper precautions myself. So, and I'm very, very aware. I read everything. I've listened to so many different people, read so many books. The best book that I ever read was called The Invisible Rainbow. And, um, uh, it, Arthur Furstenberg, and it was chronicling the invention of electricity with illness. And it's just like, so right on. Okay. Because 
electromagnetic fields are an energy force and we are energy beings. And so people always say, oh, no, it's no big deal. No, even your cell phone package says could be carcinogenic. So, and I always tell people, even if 10% of it, the information is, is real, we all need to be precautionary, okay? Not wearing our cell phones. We know that even the studies showing if you wear your cell phone, you increase the infertility by 50%. So, and then I know I've heard doctors talking about when pe people wear it in their pocket, you're increasing their risk of colon cancer. So, you know, wearing this device is not good, okay? It's not a good thing at all. And so, because people don't understand that we we are energy, we are we are a bioenergetic being, and so anyway, um, people just I think they they have this casual. But yes, there's a lot of people that are experts, especially the people who have been affected by it, like Arthur Furstenberg, and almost every person I know who's kind of an expert. They're sensitive to electromagnetic fields, so everyone needs to really take the proper precautions and try to ground every day. Turn off their electricity not wear their cell phone, have it on airplane mode, all these proper things that we can do to avoid because, you know, we want to use the technology as a tool, okay? Not as something that our life is dependent upon it, okay? And I grew up without a cell phone, so I didn't, you know, I didn't have a cell phone until, you know, 30s. And so, so it wasn't part of my life, but a young person is, 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 you know, that's what, that's their whole life is technology, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's cell phones and there's, there's tablets and there's the TV, the computer, we're all streaming and it's, we're just bombarded. And from birth to 18, your body it, neurological system isn't developed. So it's not something that young people should have. Like I know I was talking to one of my patients yesterday. I'm seeing him. He's 38 years old. I'm seeing him for melanoma and low testosterone. And so we were, he has three children and he was telling, we were talking about parenting and I never allowed my kids to have a cell phone until they drove. And so he was saying, well, that's what I'm doing with my kids. I get them off technology. I get them outside. I get them in sports. I get them. And I said, gosh, hopefully all your friends are doing the same thing. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because my parents actually, I wasn't allowed to have a cell phone until I turned 18. Really, that was like the rule. And because they thought, well, if you're not driving anywhere, why do you need a cell phone? Well, your parents were smart. Multiple studies point to a link between dehydration and a higher risk of anxiety and depression. And if you have low levels of electrolytes, it can cause anxiety or panic-like symptoms. Some of the most common causes of electrolyte imbalance are due to fluid loss. Adding electrolytes is a great way to replenish and rebalance your body, mind, and mood. However, most electrolyte drink mixes contain added gums, sugars, colors, and even added oils. I'm really picky about what goes into my body. So that's why I choose Elements Raw Unflavored Electrolyte Mix. Elements Unflavored Version contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio of salt, magnesium, and potassium. Those three simple ingredients are in their raw unflavored packs. So whether you just finished a workout, sauna session, or just need to hydrate for your mental health. Element is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs and is perfectly suited for those following a keto, low-carb, vegan, or paleo diet. And right now, Element is offering my listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single-serving packets free with any Element order. Element also has a no questions asked refund policy. So if you try it, don't like it, they will give you your money back guaranteed, no questions asked. So you have nothing to lose. Just go to drinklmnt.com slash digest to get this amazing offer. That's huge. People can't really live without their cell phone and they're they're tied to it. And I know a lot of people, that's their job. That's how they, they make their income and they have to do it for a lot of people, you know, myself included. But we do need to set those boundaries. And uh, 
And also what you're just taking in mentally, I feel like from your cell phone, you know, block those people that are just not giving you the good um, energy or just making you feel bad. And that can just cause more stress, which can cause, I'm sure, you know, like cancer and things like that as well, just contribute to all those different factors. Um, now I want to actually talk about, uh, fatty liver disease for a moment because, I feel like fatty liver disease is coming up in very, very young children, even toddlers. Uh, I had, I was speaking with someone else and they were uh, on the show, a, a doctor, and it's like, it, it's huge now. And it used to be called what type, type two diabetes uh, or um, like adult onset diabetes and things like that. And now they're not even calling it adult. So can you talk about uh, the fatty liver disease and, and what that's doing now? Right. Well, we do ultrasound in our office is one of our technologies because I love ultrasound. It's a non-injurious, you know, doesn't affect your immune system or anything and tells you lots of information. So you can look at your thyroid, you can look at your blood vessels, you can look at your whole abdomen, liver, spleen, kidney, pancreas, all that. So, and then, and then a pelvic ultrasound looks at all your female anatomy or a prostate. And so I love it. And so we see, I saw years ago, I go, oh my God, why does everybody, why is there so many people with fatty liver? So I noticed it early on because we do ultrasound in the clinic and, and my tech who I, who's been with me for 20 years or so. And he's like, Oh my God, another fatty liver, another lot of liver. And, and I see it in young people. I see it in older people and everything. And so, um, so I, the, 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 actually the literature says that, you know, it's about 30% of the population. I think it's more because I think a lot of people don't get diagnosed and you mentioned about children. I read a study that in San Diego, 11% of the school age children have fatty liver. And you're like, why is this just okay? Like, why aren't we, it's just alarming to me that we have these supposed public health experts and they are doing nothing. They are doing nothing to create awareness, to, to talk about health. No one dares to talk about health and how you get it and how many books and how many PubMed articles there are and diet and lifestyle. I mean, this is ridiculous. I'm sorry. It's, uh, and I've been saying it's kind of a 911 for a long time. And here I am saying it. We're like, we're beyond 911 now. This is beyond an emergency. So, fatty liver is a big problem. Doctors in the conventional world, what do they have in their toolkit? A big Z route. Why? Because lifestyle is how you fix fatty liver, right? You don't, there's not a drug fatty liver. So all doctors know how to do is prescribe you a drug. medication, yeah. give a drug, but drugs go through the liver. So they're just going to make your fatty liver worse. Okay. And then what I find is I have these patients come in and they're on a statin drug and this drug. And I'm like, well, your, your fatty liver is just getting worse because you've got to get off the drug so your liver can repair itself. So I get the patients off the drugs and then you know, I do what I do is I put them on a 21 day cleanse um, and it, which is focusing on the liver. All right. And then um, I have them do either infrared sauna or a bath. If people don't have infrared sauna, I have them do a detox bath of Epsom salts, baking soda and clay. Then I have them do a liver flush, uh, which I've been doing, having patients do for a very, very long time. Um, and that you usually start like um, at nighttime at six and you're done at 9 a.m. the next morning. So it's not like, okay, you can't do it. It's not impossible. And so patients do a liver flush and then I give them liver protection. I use different supplements to, to you know, um, protect the liver. And in fact, personally, I take something for my liver every day because I see so many people with fatty liver. And so because so much is going through our liver, I my diet is is really, really good. It's not, and I don't really drink mm -hmm. alcohol. What do you do for your liver daily? So I take something called ultra liver protect. All right. Um, and I know I don't have a fatty liver because I do whole body ultrasound all the time. So, because it's at the office, that's what I do. I do a liver flush like every three months. Uh, occasionally I put a castor oil pack over my liver. So patients can do that at nighttime. And then what I do in the clinic, if I have a patient that's really bad, I give them an IV of phosphatidylcholine 
and Hepar, it's a homeopathic from Germany. And because, you know, like we have to turn this around like quickly, all right? So what is phosphatidylcholine? Phosphatidylcholine is what makes up the cell membrane of every cell in your body. And so you have the wall is made up of essential fatty acids. They call them essential because you need them. So you can get them in your eating, but you might need to take an essential fatty acid supplement. And then I call the essential fatty acids, the bricks and the cement is the phosphatidylcholine. So the greatest concentration of phosphatidylcholine is in your brain and in your liver. So if you give this intravenous, it, you know, it, it really bypasses the gastrointestinal tract. And so it works very well to get rid of um, fatty liver. The other thing I use is choline enemas. I have patients do choline enemas. I have, actually have them buy choline and make an enema um, and have them do that daily. So it's a, this is a big problem. And the problem is, is that what happens when you don't treat fatty liver? It turns into cirrhosis. Fatty liver is treatable. Cirrhosis is not treatable. And I've had patients that the doctor didn't do anything and they have cirrhosis and it's terrible. And it's, there's not, I mean, I always can come up usually with something, but it's not easy to treat. So I always tell people, you know, this is not a insignificant situation. This is a very serious situation because let's say you get diagnosed when you're 10, right? And there are people that are 10 and have it. You are risking developing cirrhosis and the doctors don't tell them. I know because I see patients all the time who come from other physicians and I go, oh, it says you have fatty liver. Did your doctor tell? No. And I'm like, well, let me sit next to you and show you on your scan. So, because I always teach people how to read the results they need. I said, this is your stuff. This is your body. We need to know everything. I want you to learn. So that's why I always give patients copies. I write on everybody's lab results. I circle on the scans. I highlight it because I said, you need to take ownership of your own body, the miracle that you get to live in every day. You got to steward that miracle so that it works for you every single day. I tell people, there is not a body available on Amazon. So you got to make your this body work. And yes. why would you want to be suffering and sick? I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't want to feel like that. I want to be the best at my uh, that I possibly can be. Yeah. So, so going back, um, what are the causes of fatty liver disease? If someone's listening and they're like, "Well, maybe I don't have it, but I don't want to get it," well, how can you avoid avoid it? What are the causes? Yeah. At first thing is what's going on in your mouth. Okay. What are you eating? Okay. If you're eating processed, chemicalized food that has no nutrient value, you are going to have high risk. Now, the other big thing is toxicity in the environment. I talked that we're in the great poisoning. The toxins that are going in our body are abominable, okay? This has been factually proven with people, that them taking the blood in the placenta, the breast milk, the blood. I, you know, I do the testing myself. We have a, a a toxic pollutant panel. Everybody has it. Okay. So you've got to, I tell people, you've got to detox every single day, but it starts with what are you putting in mouth? Are you putting chemicals in? You've got to, you've got to stop putting the chemicals in. Okay. Yeah. All the you've dyes. Have, all yeah. All the dyes, all the insecticides, pesticides, uh, you know, the plastics, you got to get rid of plastics in your yeah. life. Like I don't have any I haven't had plastic in my life. I, I was talking about plastics 32 years ago. So, um, and people thought I was crazy and I'm like, no, it's look, if you read the studies, it's, it's terrible. Okay. Yeah. So, and then you have the PUFAs and then it goes on and on. There's so many chemicals now there we're, we're just, it's all a chemical soup. And so, and they're not doing anything about it. Okay. So I tell people, you've got to take charge of your own body and start doing it. So, um, you know, so you've got to stop putting, but it starts with what, what is do a forensic analysis of your darn food. If you don't know what's in your food and if you can't read the ingredients, it's mm -hmm. too complicated. That means you shouldn't be eating it. Yeah. So you've got to really focus on you know, foods that are going to nourish, strengthen, and, and also help detoxify. Like we're eating radishes is great for your liver. Okay. 
Um, doing cilantro um, and chlorella is great for heavy metals and detox. Like I have every yeah. pregnant patient take chlorella every single day. So they detox themselves and the baby. So there's so many little things that people can do, you know, themselves. Mm -hmm. So what are some other good um, fatty liver detoxes? I know you, you just mentioned radishes. And then uh, you also mentioned that you yourself do a liver flush every three months. Should everyone be doing that? Yes. Everybody today should be doing a liver okay. cleanse. So and, what is so a liver I have flush my or a patient, cleanse? Yeah. So I have my patients, everyone at, at the clinic will either do a liver flush or a coffee enema. And so uh, coffee enemas, you know, they've been around for a very long time. So uh, people um, get a, actually, they, they always say, gosh, I feel so great, you know, after I do a coffee enema. Uh, and it's not Starbucks coffee. It's a special kind of blonde coffee that patients do. And then the liver flush, what you do is you start at 6 p.m. You do Epsom salts um, in, in water, all right, with vitamin C. And then you do that two times. And then right before you go to bed, it's olive oil and organic grapefruit juice. And we give our patients um, special um, pills that helps, you know, get rid of the, uh, helps get rid of um, and activate the liver. And then the next morning you do Epsom salts and vitamin C again twice, and then you're done. Okay. So, so you're, it's you're not, drinking that. Yes. You're drinking it. Okay. And so, and you do go to the restroom a lot. Okay. Uh, which is okay because you know you want to you want to cleanse everything out, um, and so that's something I've been recommending for a very very long time. So it's nothing new. And then like I like I mentioned the castor oil, castor oils, the wonder oil. So we have give the patients a little um, special blanket that they put the castor oil on, and you put it on. I have patients put it on their breast, on their liver, their abdomen, different body parts. So what does castor oil do? It helps detoxify, it helps the immune system, and helps any kind of swelling. So, and it's a very effective, very old tool, actually, um, that's been around for a long time. That's what things, we need to go back to the way things were done a long, long time ago. You know, you know, a hundred years ago, doctors did not have any medications, right? So they had to make potions, you know, they had to, they had apothecary that they would make their, you know, the remedies themselves. Yeah. That's real, yeah. that's reality, so. And the benefit is that there's really no side effects as opposed to taking a medication and popping pills and things like that. Now, I want to switch gears a little bit because, I mean, just for time's sake, because I have so many questions, I do want to uh, address obesogens and your your knowledge of that. And a lot of people don't even know what obesogens are. And so I know you had talked about toxins, which is a huge obesogen, but let people know what are obesogens and you know what what do they do to the body? So there's obesogens and there's diabetogens. So these are substances that contribute to the syndrome of obesity. Diabetogens are substances that intoxicate the pancreas and create diabetes. So we have all these chemicals um, that are that do that they call help you know unfortunately contribute to the cause of obesity and so that's why it's so important that if you go on any kind of weight loss program and like i said i i know every trick and you know everybody wants to get on ozempic or these damn, darn peptides and i always tell people there is nothing easy quick or fast i would like it, okay but there isn't everything is due diligence and discipline and sticking to it, okay? And because if you read all the studies on all these medicines, I had a, recently, uh, one of my patients was telling me this, that they got on that peptide and they were losing so much weight and they had pancreatic cancer because that's one of the side effects. So I always tell people like, why would you endanger your system, okay? There is a correct way to do everything. And so anyone, anytime you wanna go on a, like just when patients do the cleanse, all right? they lose about nine or 10 pounds. Okay. And then just by cleansing. Okay. So people need to start doing their, you know, daily cleansing, do a jumpstart program. Um, and then, um, you know, learn how to detox. I know personally, I started doing infrared sauna 40, 20 years ago. I was 45 at the time. And we had, we've had an infrared sauna for a very long time in our clinic. 
And um, I would, I noticed, you know, because at 40, you start putting on weight, right? So I started doing infrared sauna. I immediately, after one month, I immediately stopped putting on weight. And I haven't put on weight since because I do, you know, daily detox. I do, yeah. I do all the things I'm talking about, whether it's a bath, I alternate between a bath and a sauna. So, um, and we, you know, we have, I have sauna at home and I have sauna at the clinic. And so I always tell people there isn't anything, I mean, there's, first of all, an infrared sauna, you know, will decrease your mortality by 50% if you do it, you know, six days a week, 20 minutes at high temperature. So what drug does that? What, yeah. what possibly, there isn't anything that can possibly do that. So infrared sauna just has so much power and potential to help you with your, your life and get out those uh, toxins. Because like plastics, one of the best ways to get rid of plastics is to sweat it out. And so, you know, so part of, so if you go on a weight loss program, you have to be not only whatever you're taking, but you've got to be detoxing at the same time mm -hmm. because you, like you said, these obesogens are stored, you know, they're stored in the fat tissue. And I tell people fat is an endocrine organ in and of itself. So if you don't do these things, like even lymphatic drainage, like skin brushing, something, these things, all you can do at home, you know, you do skin brushing, starting with your feet and moving up to your heart. And so these are all things to accelerate purification. I like to use the word purification as a detox sounds like a bad word, but right. purification sounds really good. And so to purify your body, this is just reality. I tell people like people can look the other way and not face these things. But, you know, uh, I've read, you know, and studied all this stuff. I go on PubMed and I always tell people we know what one chemical alone or one heavy metal or one halogen or one chemical does. But we don't know what the synergistic potential of 200 chemicals in our body and how you purify and how I purify are different. And then, you know, you've got to have like you've got to have healthy mitochondria, like your mitochondria, your powerhouse engines of your cell that make ATP, which is the currency of life. And so if you don't have your machines working, if you don't have your hormones working and you don't have, you know, everything that, you know, all in working order, you know, you're not going to be able to lose weight. And another big thing I find in women and men is I always ask them, so how many calories do you eat a day? And they're like, oh, I don't know. And I'm like, well, how are you going to lose weight if you don't know how many calories? Because your basal metabolic rate is about, for a woman, is about 1,500 calories. Well, you can eat 1,500 calories just like that, all right? So I tell them, okay, you know, the olden days where they had those little calorie books, you're probably too young, but they had those little calorie books when you checked out and, and it showed, you know, what it, you know, how many calories. And, you know, back in the day, you know, that's what people had to do is they had to learn their, you know, what, how many calories and you mm -hmm. had to keep a, you know, you keep a journal. If you keep a journal of what you're eating, you'll realize how much you're eating because most people mindlessly eat. Yeah. People like to, they, they try to, to resolve their emotion, uh, emotional, you know, problems with eating. And so they're mindless. They're not conscious of their eating. But if you really literally broke down what you eat and drink, you know, uh, you know, for like juices, you know, have lots of calories. OK, so if you actually wrote it up, what you were eating, you know, 1500 calories, like I said, goes like that. And so like if a woman wants to lose weight. She's got to go down to, let's say, a thousand calories or twelve hundred. But how much weight loss are you going to lose? You're only going to lose one pound a week because what happens is a pound is thirty five hundred calories. So if you go from fifteen hundred to a thousand, that's five hundred surplus calories you're burning. And as long as you're exercising, five hundred times seven is thirty five hundred calories. So it's one pound. So people always want to lose two to three pounds a week. There's no such thing. You are losing muscle. Well, when you lose muscle, which we don't want to lose because at 30, we start losing three to five percent per decade. And at 60, you're losing you're losing more muscle and muscle has higher metabolic rate at rest. So like you're totally, you know, not doing what you need to do and aware of what you need to do. Yeah. And, and also too, I mean, I feel like for many, one, you know, counting calories could 
could just be like too much for a person. And I feel like definitely 1200 calories a day is definitely not enough for, I personally feel like that's not enough for anyone to survive on just 1200 calories. And also I feel like many people focus on calories where they really should be focusing on nutrients and they should be focusing on just whole foods because, you know, the calories from a pop tart is not the same calories from a grass fed beef and things like that. So, you know, when, when someone says just count calories, it's like, well, no, because it's really about the nutrients that you're consuming, not just the energy. That's right. That's a given. So, because what happens is if you eat a pop tart, which is 100% sugar and chemicals and God knows what dyes and so forth. And so what happens is your sugar goes up, the pancreas produces insulin to bring down the sugar. And so what do you do? You have a roller coaster like this with your blood sugar. And then what happens is you metabolize that sugar in that Pop-Tart and then you're hungry in an hour, okay? So if you ate eggs and avocado, all right, uh, then, and maybe sliced tomatoes, right? Then your insulin's gonna stay stable because you need to eat fat. I eat plenty of fat. I'm very mindful and conscious and you probably are too, or you wouldn't be doing this podcast. So you have to get the patient there. So usually we have to spoon feed to the patient and slowly, slowly, you know, change their thinking and Etc. And then also people are hungry because they eat so much carbohydrates and the insulin calls in and brings down your blood sugar. And so then you get hypoglycemic and then you want to eat again. Whereas if you eat fat, fat lasts for eight hours. So if you eat plenty of fat, okay, good fats, olive oil and butter and coconut oil and all that good stuff. And then you eat protein, not voluminous amounts of protein because people eat too much protein. So you want to eat protein at every meal and then you want to eat favorable carbohydrates, which are fruits and veggies. And so, like you said, you talk about nutrients. You want to eat very nutrient dense food. You know, if you looked how people ate hundreds of years ago, they were hunter gatherers and they ate, you know, they ate what they hunted. They made their butter and then they ate uh, fruits and veggies, seeds and nuts, you know, so this is how they ate. So they had, you know, they were ate very nutrient dense food. Now our soils are so destroyed. Okay. They used to have, you know, 12 feet of really good. soil. now we're lucky we got one foot of, of good soil. And so, um, so you have to unfortunately kind of overdo your nutritional content because what was available, you know, 50 years ago, hundred years ago, yeah. you know, it's not as good as it is to, you know, what we, um, you know, what it's not today is not as good as it was a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. And then, well, let's just, speaking of pop tarts and going back to that, I'm just thinking of like childhood and different things like that. And because there's so much lack of education, uh, when it comes to child development and what the children are eating. And there are so many different behaviors linked to children's diet and just from the food dyes and the processed foods. And I feel like today's doctors, they're not really addressing that, but they're just giving a pill for this and that, that they're seeing in children. And so there's the, the, the lack of education, but what else do you see as far as the children's diet linked to their behavior and how do you how do you navigate around that i had three of my own biological children and four step kids so you know i grew up in texas and my mother was a fanatic about our food so we never went out to eat we never had sugar uh she made everything you know herself she was an amazing cook and I mean, we grew up on raw milk. We grew up on sauerkraut. We grew up on liver and onions. My mom even had a meat grinder that she clamped to the table and made liver pate. So I grew up, you know, I never grew up with, you know, I never had cereal. Okay. And so, cause cereal, I tell people is like eating a candy bar for breakfast. And so, um, so, you know, I grew up like that. So my, you know, my upbringing was like that. And so of course with my kids, you know, I made their breakfast and I always had a different breakfast every day. And then we made school lunches and then home, we had dinner every single night. 
Um, and so we, we didn't, you know, I never bought cereal for breakfast. Okay. That's how can you possibly, the number one thing for children is what they're putting in their mouth. Okay. And I, and I used to get so angry because people, you know, they play soccer, whatever sport, and you know, you're supposed to bring a snack. Well, I always brought fruit. Okay. Other people are bringing cupcakes and bagels and you're like, wait, you're doing all this good sports activity and then you're destroying it with, you know, junk food. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so people need to get rid of that. They need to take a stand. And unfortunately, like I, I one of my patients from Los Angeles told me that they have food for all, you know, for the school kids. And she goes, it is the worst diet you can possibly imagine. So, and then they want to know why they have behavioral problems in school and yeah. anxiety and depression and ADD and et cetera, et cetera. And diabetes. Now, after the year 2000, one in three kids has diabetes. I'm like, this is just horrific that we supposedly have a public health system and it is we're producing, you know, adults that are not healthy. I mean, yeah, the health system now is, is I'm, my mind is blown. And what is your take? Because come this fall, the uh, Lunchables will actually be served in school lunch programs, the, you know, the little package Lunchables. Now they're going into schools and they're saying that this is going to be a good alternative and a healthy alternative for kids. What's your, what's your view on that? <laughs> you know, I would, it's so funny because I remember when my twins who were 28, they were in first grade and I picked them up from school and they're, you know, people, they, they go, mom, people are asking like, what is in our lunch? I said, you know what? Two things. One, I want you to have the very best food and I personally do it. And two, I love you so much that I want you to have the best possible health outcomes. And so anyway, I never heard anything since. And, you know, now they're all health fanatics, you know, of course, because, you know, I took, I, I, I held my ground. Okay. And I wasn't one of these parents like, oh, you can't do Halloween. You can't do an Easter egg hunt. No, you know, they have to have fun too. Okay. We, we have to have a chocolate chip cookie here and there, but you know, we, we've got to do fun things. Okay. So I would, I always like made it a big deal. So Halloween, you know, they walked around the neighborhood and I mean, exhaustively around the neighborhood. So any candy that they ate that day. And then of course the next day that candy's gone. Okay. And so, um, so I wasn't like one of these, like, okay, you, you know, you never can do something fun. That's, yeah. you know, and I always had to make sure my, my kids were in sports. And so always, they always had to do, everyone has to do every sport and figure out, I said, how are you going to know if you like something if you don't do it? And so we, we have to educate parents. So I take that opportunity here in the clinic every day when I have a parent or a grandparent, I take every, I talk about this a lot and, and frequently, uh, because I always tell people, when people tell me, like, I remember years ago, I had this patient who had, they came to see me for, with their children, um, and they had some kind of learning disability. And I said, well, you've got to change their eating. She goes, how do you do that? And I'm like, no, that's all you have. I said, trust me, the kid's not going to start. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because they will, they might miss a meal, but eventually they're going to get so hungry that they're going to eat. And I go, and people have to get creative. Like I was so creative with, you know, how I presented the food. Like, you know, you have to make it, uh, you know, good and good tasting and healthy all at the same time. And so, and now there's so many good cookbooks out there to yeah. do that. And introducing good food when they're young. And so you bring them up in that um in that way and then they they don't know any different really. If, if it's harder to switch a children's diet at age five than it is to just introduce those foods at at the beginning. Well, that's what I tell everyone. I said if you grew up only on miso soup and fish and seaweed, that's all you'd know. Okay. And so, you know, though, all this other junk. So that's why, but don't even introduce that. And don't, don't make it that sh sugar Oreo cookies are part of your life every day. Okay. This is something because you can make, like I made really good oatmeal uh, protein cookies. Okay. And so they tasted great, wonderful. And, and so you can take, make 
you know, food, whether it's like healthy tacos, for example, for kids, okay? Great meatloaf. I mean, it's so funny when I'd have patients come in and I would ask the kid, okay, so tell me what do you, tell me what do you, what's your ideal breakfast, you know? And they'll say, and I go, okay, do you like, do you like eggs? Oh yeah, I like eggs. And I'm like, okay, mother, get eggs in, okay? And then I'll ask them, do you like turkey sausage? Do you like, you know, what fruit do you like? I mean, if you ask the kid, they will come up with good, healthy things. All right. And so I, but like you said, I like, I believe you've got to start this from that day that baby's born. I mean, usually, ideally, you'd like a mother to breastfeed. Okay. Uh, because the nutrition in breast, yeah. breast milk is ideal. Not everybody can. And then I always, I have my patients give a formula uh, to make their own, okay? You can try to find a good formula. There's not a lot of good formulas out there, uh, but you know, years ago they didn't have formula, so they had to make it. So I, um, I have a recipe for you to make your own. Yeah. Um, like, well, there's a also a brand too. I think it's called Mount Capra. They have, yeah, it's a, a goat milk. Yeah, I used to be involved with them. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I, I fed my kids, uh, you know, goat milk. And yeah. so after their first year of life, I I fed them goat, I mean, gave, gave them goat milk. And so that's a very, you know, viable option. But what I'm saying is there there's things you can do to make your own formulas, because especially when kids are, are sensitive. And so, um, and then the mothers that can't breastfeed. And yeah. so there are good, healthy options. And then- you know, you start, like you said, children are brilliant at one year and six months of year. They're genius, really, really brilliant. If you really study, yeah, crazy. you know, what they, how brilliant in their uptake. So it's all about what you are programming them. And, but the number one thing has to be what they're eating. And there's so many books on this. So I, you know, I don't have one particular book, but there are so many books written on how to create healthy foods. I know doctor, I know some lady doctors who have written books. I gave it to my children um, when they started having grandkids and uh, so are their own children. And so there are, and there's so much online now. And kids watch you. So if you're eating a healthy diet, then you know, it's going to be passed down to them. They're going to want to eat. If you're not eating a healthy diet and you're telling your child to, uh, I don't think that's going to go over really well. <laughs> that's very true. I always tell p- parents, it's not what you tell your children, it's what you model 24-7. They, are, they have amazing uptake on everything. And so you've got to model the behavior you desire in your children, whatever it is, okay? Like you said, eating, but could it be anything? It could be how you treat other people. It could be, uh, you know, your daily life. Do you exercise? You know, how do you sleep? You know, what what is your yeah, routine? The energy just in the house and yeah, for sure. The energy in the house. That's what I always tell people. You've got to, I remember when my kids were young, I I played classical music for so that they would be calm and uh, no, and, and you, and there's so many books, like I, you know, I babysat, but you know, when I, I, when I had my own kid, I didn't know. So I had to go devour all the books to see like, okay, what, what makes sense? Why would I reinvent the wheel here? I'm not the first mommy. So I just read all the books to create this environment because it, you know, it's all about the environment that the mother is creating. Yeah. Well, you have brought up so many great points about so many different topics of cancer and just uh, fatty liver disease and, um, where can people find you? What's your website? All that good stuff. We'll make sure we put it in the show notes, but for people to hear, uh, where can people find you? Right. Well, they can follow me on Instagram, Keneally MD. And then our websites are Center for New Medicine and Cancer Center for Healing. And you're located here in Irvine, California. That's correct. In Irvine. We're probably the largest integrative functional clinic in, in the United States. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I really appreciate your time. I know you have patients to see right after this podcast. So I just want to be cognizant of the time and all and respect that. But thank you so much for coming on the show today. And I can't wait for everyone to hear. Thank you for the privilege. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digest This. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review in your podcast app to let us know. If you're ever wondering how you can support me and this podcast, 
Sharing it with your friends and family is the best way. This is a Resonant Media production produced by Drake Peterson and edited by Chris McComb. To email the show, message us at digestthispod at gmail.com. See you next time. The content of this show is for educational and informational purposes only. It is not a substitute for individual medical and mental health advice and does not constitute a provider-patient relationship. As always, talk to your doctor or health team first. Looking to build a more robust foundation in your health and well-being? From the producer of Digest This comes one of the most popular alternative health shows on Apple Podcasts, The Dr. Tina Show. Dr. Tina Moore is a naturopathic physician and chiropractor, traditionally and alternatively trained in science and medicine. The show features exclusive interviews with experts such as Sean Stevenson, Mike Mutzel, Mark Groves, and even solo episodes covering metabolic health, pharmaceuticals, chronic diseases, long hauler syndrome, and pain management. Dr. Tina delivers the information in a no-nonsense, real-world style, and she has the science to back it up. The Dr. Tina Show is edgy, entertaining, and informative. Every episode will leave you with a new pearl of health wisdom to expand your knowledge base. When you're empowered, you can do better for yourself, your family, and your community. Resilience is the name of the game, and Dr. Tina is here to guide you on your way. Listen to The Dr. Tina Show today on your favorite podcast app. New episodes every Wednesday. Produced by Drake Peterson and Resident Media.